So good afternoon, everyone. I noticed that uh, we've got lots of socializing, which is great. Um, but I want to remind you, there's gonna that we have this room until 1:30. Uh, so we're hoping that this conversation stimulates a lot of ideas, and that uh, those of you that have not gotten some food in the back, that that's you know you can get some food afterwards, and we can have lots of questions and uh, intermingling. Uh, I'm Jonathan Patz. I'm the director of the Global Health Institute and one of the co-sponsors of this event. The other co-sponsor is the Office of Sustainability. So this is a joint venture. Uh, and it's very much in line with what the leadership around campus is interested in pursuing, which is to have a unique confluence of the, in the areas of health and energy. And in fact, just yesterday, I came out of a meeting where um, G General Electric, that does a lot of work on campus, is looking for integrated projects. And the idea of combining technology and energy and health imaging and things like that, uh, they really, um, it sounds like people are wanting to pull things together. And uh, in today's world, the two topics, global health and energy, uh, in my opinion, are two of the highest priority topics that we could put together, which is why I am really excited about this seminar uh, entitled The Power of Poop, etc. And um, because it really is one of these win win situations, it's a pilot project that we are really excited about. Now, how did this project start? Uh, it happened that uh, we have an integrating certificate here on campus, the Certificate in Humans and the Global Environment. This is out of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. And in that uh, certificate, students from across disciplines are forced to work together for an entire year and a half with a, a final capstone project. Um, a couple, actually I think two years ago, the project on bio, uh, biogas uh, started, it was called Got Gas. Now, for those of you from this country, you know the advertisement about Got Milk. Well, this is about Got Gas. And um, the um, mentor, the faculty leader mentor for that project uh, was Gary Radloff. And Gary is here and also the mentor for this group. Uh, Gary is the director of energy policy for the Energy Institute, so he was the right person to go to to really help kick this off. Uh, the student team, um, St Sarah Stefanos, Aliyah McCord, and Jeff Stark, and anyone else? What's that? And Mirna Santana. Mirna Santana. The four of them. Um, started this and at least three quarters of that group went to Germany to ask the question, why does Germany have 27,000, what, six? Okay, oh, why does, Matt, why does Wisconsin have 27 biodigesters, but Germany has 6,000 and yet we have the same number of cows? And so they went over there and started this project uh, looking at uh, biodigesters. Uh, and then this has evolved uh, to bring in uh, African um, partners that uh, I will let Aliyah introduce because this project uh, that we're going to hear about is a pilot project in Uganda. Uh, Aliyah McCord uh, has been over there working with uh, her advisor, Tony Goldberg, looking at poop for other reasons, actually looking at genetic analysis uh, studying the, the uh, transfer of diseases from animals to humans and vice versa in uh, Kibale, Uganda, a project of Tony Goldberg's. And Tony is from the vet school, professor and associate director for research uh, in the Global Health Institute. So Aliyah was over in Uganda and, um, you know, picking up things and analyzing them, and one thing led to another. Uh, and Aliyah is one of our uh, distinguished. Um, uh, NSF Eigert Fellows and went through the Change Certificate Program. So I will bring, ask Aliyah to really uh, 
get this rolling. And uh, in, fa in case I forget, I'll just say that um, the next Global Health Seminar Series, it's going to start uh, on September 18th, uh, looking at the silent epidemic, coal and the hidden threat of health. Again, another energy health theme. So, okay, Aaliyah. Great. Thanks so much, Jonathan, and thanks everyone for coming this afternoon. Um, just to pick up where Jonathan left off, this project really got started in kind of a funny way. So, as Jonathan mentioned, we were working on biogas here in Wisconsin, and I was talking about it while I was in Uganda with my graduate student colleague, Alex Tumakunde, who also works in the same study system that I do with Tony Goldberg. And I was talking about biogas in Wisconsin to Alex, and Alex said, oh my gosh, this is a brilliant idea. We, we have to do it here. So we started looking around, poking around Uganda, and we found out people were already doing it in Uganda, actually. And we, so we met Viani Tumaswije, who's our um, invited guest this afternoon. And turns out uh, Vianney's constructed 26 small-scale biogas systems across Uganda. He's a uh, research fellow at the Center for Research in Energy and Energy Conservation at Makere University. And um, he's also a World Wildlife Fund Young Achiever as well, recognized by President Museveni last year for, for all of his work that he's done integrating waste management and energy production. And so we started working um, with Vianney and really had the wonderful opportunity to, to visit his small scale systems. And I said, oh my gosh, we really need to bring Vianney here to Wisconsin to show people in Wisconsin what amazing work that he's been doing and to think about whether or not this might be appropriate for our context. So it's with great pleasure that I, intru that I introduce you to Vianney Tumaswite. Welcome. Thank you, Alia. And thank you to the Global Health Institute for giving me an opportunity to come to Wisconsin. It's, a, it's great to see success in Wisconsin as it has had with large biogas scale systems. I would like to share with you my experience with small scale biogas systems in Uganda. But before I start, I would, I would want to I would want to, if most of you may not be used to my African accent, please feel free to ask for clarification. Thank you. Yeah, for those of you who have not been to Uganda, Uganda is a small country found in East Africa, and it lies along the lake shores of Lake Victoria. I've constructed over 26 systems, small scale biogas systems, and they are represented in black spots. To give you a brief, I'll first explain what biogas is, and then I'll share with you the benefits and challenges of small-scale biogas systems in Uganda. A biogas system transforms waste into renewable energy. Here is an overview of a biogas system. It takes in human feces, animal dung, and food scraps. The food scraps go into an anaerobic digester where microorganisms feed on the waste to produce biogas and a fertilizer. Biogas can be used for lighting or cooking, and the solid waste can be used as a crop fertilizer. Here are some of the images of some, you know, some of these images were taken from the systems I've been constructing in the past three years. And I always encourage my clients to use cow manure to kickstart the process of biogas formation. Cow manure gets, mix, gets into a mixing tank. It's a concrete tank. We add rainwater to the mixing tank and it's properly mixed. And then we let the mixed manure into a tubular, into in, through a tube into an underground tank. That's where biogas is formed. Other than, other than dealing with organic waste, I decided to incorporate plastic bottles. You know, pl plastic bottles are waste in Kampala. So I decided to incorporate the plastic bottles as construction materials. So the wall you see in front here, actually even the back wall, was constructed out of plastic bottles. That's another way of managing waste. 
I love this picture, I mean, I love this project because it's a second of its kind in Uganda where plastic bottles have been used as a construction material. So instead of letting them, instead of throwing them on the streets, we decided to use them as a construction material. Other than, other than, other than animal waste, we also use food scraps as a feedstock for biogas production. The picture you see right here, it's my recent project done in July, where I led a team of United States Military Academy at West Point. They came over to help build the biogas system for a school of a thousand students. The wall you see right here, it, it's, that's where the latrine is going, to be pro, pro, is going to be constructed, and all human waste will go through and underground tubes into a biogas unit. It's a dome, and in there, gas is generated, and it's piped to the kitchen for cooking. Then the pressure of the gas pushes the waste into a secondary tank, and the waste can be used as a fertilizer. Other than a fixed dome, we realized that you know, the cost of building a fixed dome is too high. We decided to investigate other alternatives for households. The system you see right here, it's a flexible tube. It takes in waste from the tube, I mean, takes in waste, waste gets into a biogas unit, and the reaction is more or less the same, like what happens in a fixed dome. The only difference is it's you not know, made out of plastic, and gas is piped through a pipe to the kitchen, which is about 20 meters away from that point. Then the solid, the solid waste that is generated after, fertilizer, after biogas production, it's taken as a fertilizer. So this fertilizer can be used at the small, at the family farm. The gas, which is mainly methane, is piped up to 300 meters away from the biogas system. And mainly people, most of my clients have been using the gas for cooking because charcoal and firewood are very expensive, but some Ugandans prefer using it as a lighting source. This, the waste product, the solid waste product from the biogas system is safe for handling. Now that most of you know what a biogas system is, I would want to share with you the benefits, some of the benefits associated with having a small a biogas system. Biogas systems sub sustainably improve public hygiene. Over 95% to 98% of the pathogens Guess they get destroyed in the biogas system, and the fertilizer, the solid waste that comes out of a biogas system, is good, is safe to be handled. Other than pathogens, the digested or the food waste or the waste attracts pests, and once you manage, once once the waste gets into the biogas system, we don't we, we avoid such pests from associating with people. Most of these pests are disease causing. This picture right here shows a baboon and the other one shows a rat. They normally will want to come to feast on the waste. Other than disposing of waste, uncollected waste normally ends up in rivers and lakes, thereby causing a thereby causing contaminating drinking water. Now, if, you, if human waste is not managed well, the picture you see right here is a normal pit latrine used in Uganda. The fecal matter gets piled up in a, third, a 15 to 30 feet ditch, and most of most cases, this waste gets, contam gets co contaminated the water table. So with the biogas system, it's normally constructed above the water table, and fecal matter can't move from the biogas unit to the water table. So there we, we guarantee safe water for drinking.
Indoor air pollution is a menace in Uganda. Over 97% of the Ugandan population, they use charcoal and fired for cooking. And these fuels cause indoor air pollution, thereby causing lung diseases. Women spend four to seven hours next to open fire, and most cases they're with young children. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 1.6 million people die each year from indoor air pollution. And, and currently, we, me and some team from Aberdeen University and Macquarie University, we are investigating the effect of indoor air pollution in homes. So in Feb, we, we took air monitors in people's homes. We are dealing with a small community in Uganda. And the preliminary results we got indicate that there are two major peaks of exposure. Morning hours during cooking time and evening, evening hours during still cooking time. The, the red spikes you see indicate the carbon monoxide exposure. And this is way above the maximum exposure recommended by WHO. Then the blue spikes represent the particulate matter exposure. And this is still way above the EPA levels recommended. So you can see that exposure to due to poor air quality is a problem in Uganda because of fire and charcoal. Then other than indoor air pollution, the 3% of the population that can afford LPG still find it hard to, uh, they, find, they, find, they find it hard to access LPG because most of it is, most, all of the LPG is imported into the country and it's not sustainable. As long as people, as long as people produce waste, they can produce biogas. These are some of my clients at Arlington School. They, that was the first time they saw biogas, and they are getting biogas from seven cows and fecal matter from 350 children. The gas is able to, represent, to, to replace 40% of their cooking needs. Then biogas can also, you know, to sell biogas in Uganda is quite a challenge because very many people don't know about biogas. So the easiest way for me to convince clients to buy a biogas system is by talking about money because each one wants to save money. And when you use biogas, you don't keep spending money over time. Some of my clients in Bwindi, it's a tourist camp next to the National Forest. And at this camp, many tourists go there to track gorillas and they decided to invest in a biogas system to produce gas for cooking. They used to buy 60 bags of charcoal every month, but since they got biogas, their charcoal consumption went up to 19 bags a month. Then other than Windy, there is a convent in Rubaga. This is the convent in Rubaga, and they have seven cows, 20 pigs. So we built a biogas system that takes in the manure, and they were able to replace all their cooking needs with biogas. Then the surplus gas that was generated, they decided to pipe it to their neighbors. Probably the biggest cost saving from my clients comes from not building pit latrines. Pit latrines get filled up every five years, mainly for schools. And some schools spend a lot of money, about $5,000 or more, to construct new pit latrines. There is a school in Eastern Uganda, it has used over half an acre of land by building and ref uh, building pit latrines. So when you look at the amount of area wasted, it's a menace. Collecting firewood is time consuming. And unfortunately, most of this work is done by women who walk over five kilometers every day to collect firewood. Uganda has one of the highest rates of soil depletion on the planet. 
and yet it has one of the lowest rates of fertilizer application in the world. To compound this problem, Uganda is, one, is home to the third fastest growing population in the world. For most of you who don't know Uganda, let's compare Uganda. Uganda is, is more or less the size of Oregon, the state of Oregon. It is home to 34 million people. When I compare Uganda to Wisconsin, Wisconsin has about 5.7 million people. As our country continues to grow, our farmers need to grow more food. And for them to be able to grow more food, they need a fertilizer. Some farmers report, some of the farmers that have used the biogas slurry, that's a solid waste from our systems, have reported about 60% increase in crop yield. Biogas systems can also mitigate global climate change in three ways. First of all, anaerobic digesters capture emissions from decomposing waste, preventing methane from entering our atmosphere. Secondly, people who do not use biogas systems, then people who use biogas systems no longer need to burn their trash in open fields. Finally, by having biogas systems mitigates climate change by protecting critical forest habitants. Uganda, Uganda lies along the rift line, the Albertine Rift. It is home to the last existing gorillas and chimpanzees in the world. And most of these habitants are under increasing pressure from the population because people are cutting down trees for fuel and agriculture. People normally cut down trees to produce charcoal for cooking. Biogas offers forest dependent people an alternative fuel. Charcoal production is a problem for Uganda's forests, but the leading cause of deforestation in Uganda is agricultural production and expansion. Because, because Ugandan farmers need to produce more food to feed them more and more people, they need more and more land. Without the use of fertilizers, our farmers tend to cut down forests to plant more crops. Biogas systems can give farmers a way to increase yields without increasing the amount of land for growing crops. By intensifying agriculture, rather than extensifying, extensifying agriculture, we can, we can protect Uganda's forests. The small-scale systems we, we have been building in Uganda offer so many benefits. It, it, it has, it's one technology that helps support public health sustainability and conservation in many ways. Even though biogas systems have been really su successful, there are still, we still have some major challenges to implementation of the, to the wider implementation of the system. The biggest problem for my client is the high investment cost. Even though we are seeing payback periods of five years or less, many of our clients do not have the money on hand to pay for a biogas system. A fixed doom system costs about $10,000. The, the, the flexible tube costs about $400, but it does not last long. So there is a trade-off. The other system lasts long, but does it, it's very expensive. Then the flexible tube is cheap, but doesn't lo last long. So finding ways to help my clients finance their system has been one of the biggest challenges. Right now, all the systems are built have been supported in some ways by foreign funds. And I believe this is not so sustainable. I think once people understand the level, the, val the real value of these systems, it will become easier to convince them to adopt to small scale biogas systems. Right now, a lot of people don't understand how the biogas systems work or, they, or how they can save money. Each system we build helps, helps us educate new people without the power of biogas systems. That's why I like to target schools 
because they, they are places where people are eager to learn about new things. One of my favorite ch change is, one of my favorite parts of this job is helping explain biogas to kids. Behavior change is so much easier in children than in adults. Since child, children are more enthusiastic about learning new things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Viani. Um, this is Uganda's premier small-scale biogas expert, so it's really a pleasure to have him today and to have him as part of the team. Um, so now we're just going to talk really briefly about the way forward, how Uganda and Wisconsin can work together in order to realize a sustainable energy future. So first, I just wanted to talk a little bit about technology transfer. Whenever people talk about energy production, renewable energy production, or waste management, and most of all, in the field of sustainable development, this buzzword of technology transfer comes up. And usually, it's the idea of using whiz-bang gadgetry and sophisticated new technologies to transport that from the developed world, like here, to the developing world. But technology transfer should also be envisaged more widely. Technology transfer not means can encompass things like small scale, simple, low cost, and proven solutions, and also knowledge transfer. And we firmly believe here that technology transfer does not only flow from the developed world to the, to the developing world, but rather that the developing world has a lot to teach people in the developed world about how to get things done well. So one thing that we have been really getting excited about is how to maybe bring the small-scale technology that Vianney has been talking about, these small-scale digesters, and bringing them to Wisconsin and bringing them to America to use for our Wisconsin family farms. We know our family farms here are this state's pride and joy. And in so many ways, the technology that, that Vianney has been using can be used to help our small farmers um, meet their needs, which are similar in some ways to the needs of Ugandan small farmers. For example, everyone knows that waste management is a problem on these farms. You know, you have the manure, what do you do with it? You need to pay to someone to come take it off. Instead, you can use this manure and transform it into a fertilizer that you can just use right there on your farm. Similarly, you can also reduce the pathogen prevalence. Um, Vianney talked briefly about how 95 to 98% of pathogens are eliminated through this process of anaerobic digestion. And you, know, you don't want to be handling or applying raw waste to your fields, but instead, if you put it through this process, you come out with a very safe, effective, organic fertilizer to apply on site. Finally, the organic fertilizer that is applied is extremely nutrient rich. So the plants can uptake it much more easily than other types of fertilizer. You know, chemical fertilizers are, are fine and good, but this one is something that is being consistently produced and that has, and is very bioavailable, meaning that plants are really ready to absorb it. And of course, in Wisconsin, um, the unfortunate trade-off with having any kind of farming is that inevitably some phosphorus ends up in our watersheds. And that can be a problem for our beautiful lakes and rivers that are, you know, one of the wonderful things that we enjoy in this great state. And using, and using biogas fertilizer means that you manage your phosphorus much more easily because that, you know, those nutrients are taken up by plants. And of course, the best thing is that instead of having to generate electricity, like some, we have a lot of large-scale anaerobic digesters here in Wisconsin on farms, and they use that biogas they combust it and they run a generator and they generate electricity and sell it to the grid. But buying generators is not easy or inexpensive. It's quite costly. So instead, you could use the gas directly produced on farm for, for different farm needs. For example, for barn lighting. Um, you could use it to um, power some refrigeration to cool milk and other dairy products. Or you can use it to heat water, which is a, is a very large need on any farm. And best of all, this technology is quite affordable. Viani builds his systems for $10,000.
some of the large-scale digesters that we have here in Wisconsin, even in our backyard and in, uh, in Dane County, in, in Oshkosh, their systems run from five to $15 million. They're extremely high-tech, they're very sophisticated, they're beautiful, but if you're short on capital um, or if it's difficult to get a loan, you can build this quite cheaply, and Vianney has shown how you can do it um, quite affordably. And now Leo will just talk about what uh, Wisconsin's expertise um, is and how we might be able to also uh, share that. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. I'll just close this off real briefly with um, to mention that we, we do think that technology transfer can go two ways. We think it can go from Uganda to Wisconsin with this small scale technology that Vianney has. But we also think that Wisconsin has some great um, technology that could be transferred to Uganda. So specifically, you know, Wisconsin's the, the nation's leader in anaerobic digester technology. We have a lot of great companies here who are doing fantastic work. We have the largest number of large-scale systems in America here in Wisconsin, and we should be really proud of that and proud of the work that our, um, our forward-thinking leaders have done here in the state. This is a, the Dane County Digester, which is just a couple miles from here, and it's accepting waste from three dairy farms. And this is a great example of some of the really fantastic large-scale technology that we have in Wisconsin. This large-scale technology is good for large-scale problems. And you know, this is Vianney checking out some of the systems at the Dane County Landfill. And again, thanks to the Department of Energy for helping set that up um, for us. We, um, you know, we had some great visits, and we, we think that large-scale systems are appropriate for large-scale problems. And Uganda has small-scale problems like Wisconsin, but it also has some large-scale problems. You know, Uganda generates about 3,000 tons of waste a day, and about 70% of that waste is organic. Um, this is a probably maybe a quarter ton of waste. So imagine 3,000 tons of waste piled up in the streets every day. And, you know, about 40% of that waste is collected, which is great, <laughs> but the other 60% ends up in public waterways like this. And it causes these massive trash dams that lead to um, flooding in the lowest lying areas. And this is a picture that I just took on a random you know, Tuesday in October last year. So this is not an unusual occurrence. And you can see in the foreground here, this is a latrine, actually. So this flooding is a massive public health threat in Kampala. This is a very large-scale system, uh, or large-scale problem that we think needs a large-scale solution. So the four of us have been trying to envision how we can come up with a large-scale solution that might be appropriate and sharing some of Wisconsin's technology in Uganda. So we think we can set up a waste sorting, on-site waste sorting program in the city, collect some of that waste, transfer it to a central location where we can digest it in one of these large-scale anaerobic digesters, and then generate um, commercial fertilizer as well as renewable energy. And this kind of system would offer all the same benefits of the system that Vianney um, talked about. But in addition, we're offering clean streets for urban areas. We're helping protect Lake Victoria because one of the leading causes of pollution in Lake Victoria is runoff from Kampala. And you know, this is a really significant watershed that millions of rural fishermen depend on. And finally, we're creating renewable electricity um, that's robust in the face of climate change. You know, the Ugandan government actually has really forward-looking policies about promoting renewable technology, but so far they've mostly been relying on small hydro, which is fantastic, but the government's really worried that as the climate warms and changes and water patterns change, that those systems might not actually provide the energy that Uganda needs in the future. So the government is really trying to incentivize a diversification of the renewable energy portfolio. And biogas is great because we can always count on people to produce waste, <laughs> if nothing else. So thanks so much um, to the Global Health Institute for having us here. We've had a really great week and just learned a ton as a team and really thankful for this opportunity. And thanks again to the other wonderful folks who have supported us both on campus and off campus um, through the student competitions here on campus as well as um, some, some other donors that have uh, helped us along the way. And we're happy to take any questions that you might have. For questions, uh, we have a roaming mic here, so I'll run this mic around, just raise your hand. And before we do that, let me just um, send, if there's a clipboard out there like this one, please put your name down on it. You don't have to receive emails from us in the future if you don't want to, but I would like to have your name down just for our own record keeping. So I'm gonna pass this one around. And 
Jonathan, unless you have anything else to say, we'll go to questions. Thank you for the presentation. I have been asking on the cow manure digesters here in Bain County what the energy return on energy investment is, and I'm still waiting for an answer from U.S. Biogas. One thing they mentioned at a, a recent presentation was that uh, they are turning toward compressed natural gas for a value-added product, and that's what really floats the boat. So I'm wondering if that's being considered in Uganda. Yeah, we, we definitely considered doing compressed natural gas in Uganda. And actually, from the great farm tours that we did uh, Monday and Tuesday, we saw how a lot of um, people in Wisconsin are really taking advantage of compressed natural gas. And it is a great cost savings for them. I think folks were telling us that it cost them about $1.44 per gallon, gasoline gallon equivalent or less, um, uh, to fuel their vehicles with natural gas. So it's definitely worth it in Wisconsin. And in fact, diesel prices in Uganda are far higher than they are here. So it would be very valuable in Uganda as well. We're really interested in pursuing that. One of the things we want to try and do at the beginning is try to keep things as simple as possible. The, that technology is a little bit m more new. And so luckily in Wisconsin, we have companies like Angie that are based here in the state. So if there's any troubleshooting that has to go on, Angie can send people out right away. Um, we were a little worried about trying to start with CNG in Uganda because I don't know if Angie would be willing to you know, skimmy on over right away if we had problems there as well. But certainly, we're hoping in the future to expand into CNG. I think it's a great solution in Uganda and other places. Um, do you guys use any bulking agents, like high carbon bulking agents, prior to putting it in the in vessel um, digesters or to the effluent that comes out? Uh, ask when people ask questions, please identify yourself. Thanks. Um, Axel Adams, um, or do you just use it as a liquid fertilizer? We don't add anything to the fertilizer. Um, I know you mentioned a few times. Sorry, my name is Michaela Weiss. I'm an undergraduate. Um, you mentioned that 95% of the pathogens are removed, but I was wondering if there would still be any issues since 5% still remain, especially if you're using the fertilizer on food crops. Thanks. That's a great question. Actually, you know, there is that range, but more, more typically, the pathogen reduction is in the 99% range, and so most experts uh, generally agree that it's safe for handling for direct application. Um, probably with the kind, you know, with chemical fertilizers, people have to wear extensive e equipment, and there are obviously very known health hazards um, associated with chemical fertilizer. This is by far um, immeasurably safer um, than using a chemical fertilizer. Um, I'm not, it's possible, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure about that, but um, I know there are the composting facilities um, here in, in the area, and they, uh, they generally sell to farmers, and farmers are enthu very enthusiastic about buying that, that effluent and that dried uh, solid fertilizer product. We have one over here, and then we'll come back here. I was, I was just going to answer Jonathan's question about MetroGrow. It's applied directly to fields, but only for uh, animal crops. I mean, crops consumed by animals, not for direct crops for sale to humans. And in, and in Dane County, it's free to the farmers to get MetroGrow put on the field. MetroGrow is the residual biosolid from the wastewater treatment plant. I'm Lori Heineman. I was one of the Borough Business Plan Competition judges. And um, this is coming from a finance major. So um, work with me here a little bit. My question is, is when that biogas is um, actually produced and it's used for cooking, is it in the form of a liquid? Is it in the form of a vapor? And if it is, um, can it be stored for future use or does it have to be used immediately? Thank you, Lori. Basically, 
biogas is in the vapor form and what happens is the gas is normally used directly for cooking. So some, some instances, you know, the, bio, the, like fix, the fixed dome has a storage unit inbuilt. So most of the gas gets stored within the fixed dome. Even with a plastic tube digester, there's a storage unit within that same system. Thank you. There was one towards the middle here, yeah. I can talk loud, so I don't know any of these. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll use it just for the recording. All right, so anyway, uh, my question is, we have septic systems all over the state. Is there, we know how to integrate it with outhouses, that's easy. But how do we integrate it with septic systems, which are a fantastic source of stuff that we waste? And it is waste that's wasted, and now we can use it if we can integrate it. That's a great idea. And we'd love to work with you to design something like that. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of integrating with septic systems, but if you could manage that, it'd be fantastic. I, w I wonder if there might be some challenges with um, siloxides or with, with, you know, we use a lot of cleaning products and hair products that enter into our septic tanks. And so sometimes these systems can be a little temperamental, especially if you, if, if you don't have a good mix of different feedstocks. So it might be kind of challenging with all those contaminants to get um, good digestion, but it's certainly worth looking at. Yeah, it seems like a great idea. Oh, did, I don't know much about that company. Did Actually, we just heard yesterday um, from Amanda over here about a company in Oregon that builds, or you can either, they either give you the design, the blueprints, for you to design your own in-home digester to take care of your home waste needs, or they can actually build it for you for about $2,500. So there is, I mean, we don't know much about the co this company. We just heard about it, but I mean, the, it is being done apparently in some places. Um, and we definitely thought, I mean, you can apparently just spend $70 on their website and download some blueprints um, if you want to even do it yourself. Just a, a question about the small biogas digester safety. If this is vapor under pressure and people are using it for cooking and lighting, is there risk of explosion and, and fire that goes along with using these? May I have a second? Yeah, basically, thank you for the question. And so many people keep asking that same question. Yeah, no, most cases, you know, a biogas system, it's a natural reaction the pressure that builds up into the system is not as high as the gas in the tank. That's rule number, okay, rule something number one. Then, as you can see on this picture, this other tube, you can point it at it. This, this tube, this hole here, it, you know, once there's pressure into the system, it forces the solids into this other unit. So there's that self-regulating mechanism that the system has. So it's, I've never had, out of the 26, system, 26 systems, none of it has ever got any problem. And I've not had of any problem around. Thank you. Hi, um, Tyler Lark, I'm a grad student here. Um, when you build the small scale biogas systems, do you um, also construct new above ground latrines right at the site that directly integrates the human waste into them? Or can you integrate these systems into current ones? Like when you go to a school, do you use their already in place latrines? And if you do that, are there any um, difficulties getting it from a traditional pit latrine, um, either physically getting down in there or um, culturally handling human waste? Okay, Thanks. the major challenge with that, okay, one, when I go to a school, I always propose to construct a new pit latrine. Most of the old pit latrines are anywhere from 15 to 30 feet deep. It's quite hard to deal with such waste at that point. So I normally go in and construct a new pit latrine, but I connect everything to a biogas system so that no, leak, no waste goes into unwanted. Yeah. So 
So if, if these efforts keep going on the, the meteor trajectory that they are, uh, what do you anticipate is the sort of maximum percentage of Uganda's energy needs that can be met through this system, this type of system, if it were built to capacity throughout the country? And how does that compare to a place like Wisconsin, where we have things like winter and our energy needs are, are typically much higher to begin with? Have you estimated how it fits into the global, the, the overall picture of hydroelectric and possibly solar and, of course, fossil, traditional fossil fuels? Okay, I've not looked at the global picture of biogas, but to give you a statistics, we have over 20,000 schools in Uganda. Just imagine if all the 20,000 schools were connected to the biogas system, there would be a huge saving on cooking fuel. I know through Lisa Naughton's work, who's also a, a great faculty member here on campus, that even though fuel wood collection is a problem for Uganda's forests, you know, charcoal production is a bigger problem because you're cutting down a lot more trees to get, you know, little bits of charcoal prepared. And um, most people can't afford charcoal, right? So the, the people who are really using charcoal are schools and institutions. And so I think focusing on schools and institutions is a great approach to reducing the need for fuel wood. So I think, I don't know percentage-wise, but I think we could meet a lot of needs that way. In terms of electricity generation, um, Uganda's current grid has a 450 megawatt capacity. Compare that to Wisconsin's, which is, what do we learn? S what? Seven tero what was it? Uh-oh, I'm not going to look at Mandy. <laughs> we learned this yesterday. Several, no, Terra, Terra, I think it's up to a Terra, three terawatts. Order of magnitude higher than what Uganda produces. I mean, we have power plants here that produce 500 megawatts. So this could be really significant for the Uganda, Ugandan grid. I think we could probably produce, with our first system, maybe up to two megawatts, which may not sound like a lot, but if the whole country is only using 450, that's a pretty significant proportion. Hi, Gary Radloff. Um, um, uh, when we were in Germany, we, we noticed that they use sort of a very different formula for their anaerobic digesters. They put in a lot of energy crops, uh, approximately 70% crops, 30% manure. I wondered if you had started looking at all into, you know, what is the appropriate mix uh, for systems in Uganda? Uh, and I would add, I think it's still an issue in the United States that we haven't quite figured out what is the right mix uh, as well. Thanks, Gary. That's a great question. Um, the wonderful thing about the technology, as you know very well, and um, is that it's extremely adaptable. And even in the last two days, as we've been touring different digesters and waste management facilities, we've seen a plethora of different designs and different inputs that they've been using here in Wisconsin. Um, obviously, the using food crops as inputs or growing food crops specifically for usage in a biodigester is controversial. Um, but there is enough waste in, in Uganda, even in Kampala, 3,000 tons, that you probably wouldn't need to work on bringing in agricultural waste or food crop waste um, to manage these systems. And we've seen dry digesters, wet digesters, mixed digesters, the whole, the whole range. So you could really customize it to build a digester to suit um, an institution or a specific um, school's needs or a city's needs even. So I think that that's one, one of the things we're going to be doing is continuing to explore the range of options, the range of inputs that can be used to, to power some digesters. So, so I have a follow-up question, and that is, you know, looking at the full life cycle of this, of building this digester, digesters and uh, starter feed crops or whatever is required, what about maintenance and uh, you know, how difficult would this be to make this a national energy microgrid system that lasts forever? What, what is the work required to keep things going? And what have been the barriers? Why, if, you know, it's ready energy, why hasn't this uh, happened before? It's so simple. The technology is simple. What, what are the barriers and what does it take to maintain and keep it going? Great question, Jonathan. I think well, one major barrier is it's kind of gross. So, 
honestly, you know, nobody wants to know where the waste goes, right? Nobody wants to know where the waste goes the world over. Everyone just wants to flush the toilet or take out the trash and then forget about it. So I think that's, that, that's one thing is we just have a very natural um, instinct to avoid our own filth, which is good unless our populations are growing on the planet and we don't have room that we can avoid our own filth. So I think that's one actually really important behavioral component. In terms of the maintenance, the systems that Vianney is constructing are very, um, they don't have any moving parts. So the maintenance is really straightforward. Um, you know, may maybe you would have to drain and clean them, but I don't even think you've, have you drained any of yours yet? And the oldest one is 10, correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost 10 years old now. So 10 year, a system 10 years old still running with pretty much zero maintenance. Now the large scale systems have a lot more moving parts and that's a bit trickier. Um, I think. I think, you know, we talked to a lot of folks this week even, and there are some problems with ongoing maintenance, and you have to train people how to, how to properly maintain the systems, and I do think they're tricky, although I do see a trend towards moving towards uh, more simple designs. So the dry digester that we just saw yesterday in Oshkosh, at UW Oshkosh, has very few moving parts. I mean, basically, you, you put all that waste behind these bay doors, you close it, and then you wait four weeks, magic happens, and you open it, and there is your finished product. So that, I mean, that's, those kinds of systems that require less maintenance, I think, are more, are, are probably a better bet, especially in places in, like Uganda, where it might be more difficult to get replacement parts reliably. Hi, John Farrick. I'm just curious, are, is there research going on to, to get even smaller digesters? Because you know, ten thousand dollars, as you know, in Uganda is a lot of money, and and even the, the number of cattle that people have to have to to make that work if you're not at a school or or if you're just at your own homestead is is quite large. So I'm just curious if there's something looking at smaller, even smaller digesters for a smaller farmstead. Thank you for the question. We are working on exploring small-scale systems. This tube here costs about $400. We imported it from China. But we believe once, you know, this is a research I'm doing with the University of Aberdeen and Macquarie University, and we are trying to explore how long can it stay in the ground, how much gas can it produce, and what impact will it have on a family's life. It can take in basically any kind of waste, but we have decided to experiment, I to experiment it with cow dung, in people's homes. We selected a few homes with cows, so we decided to experiment it over. But by February, by end of February, we'll be having some substantial data on how much gas is used, what impact has it got on indoor air quality, and how much fertilizer do they get. Then over time, we can find out the duration it can send the ground. Thank you. Hi, uh, Matt Heinzel. Academic staff here on campus. Uh, I'm wondering about institutional barriers to uh, small scale Wisconsin uh, applications of this. Uh, uh, Jean here mentioned uh, septic systems and stuff, but you know what uh, uh, say institutional constraints are in place, and what uh, can we uh, maybe look forward to as uh, improving those to uh, adoption of small scale. If I lived on a small farm and I wanted to put one in, what kind of uh, uh, things of mine are face. Yeah, that's a great question and something we talked about a lot this week, actually. Obviously, the regulatory environment in Uganda is a little different than it is here, so there's not the kind of permitting and regulation that would go into installing one of these systems. You know, if you want to install one of these systems, it's kind of, you know, buyer beware. Yes, my school wants this, and yes, I want you to build it for me. And that's the only discussion that has to happen, especially in the rural areas. In Wisconsin, I mean, a lot of our farmers cite the sort of integrated permitting process as being a huge barrier for them, especially small farmers that don't have time to work on these issues. So one suggestion that I think we had talked about earlier this week was trying to create a sort of plug and play model that comes pre-approved for all of the sort of permitting processes that have to go on for installation so that we could offer to the farmer this, this model system that we know is automatically gonna pass, you know, DNR regulations, 
you know, gas regulations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a, there's a million things that a small farmer has to do, and that's a serious institutional barrier to adoption of this technology here. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, hi, I'm Doug. I um, actually helped commission the Oshkosh digester that, that you mentioned. But anyway, um, what I've noticed uh, is that there are barriers to implementing these in, in Wisconsin here as far as uh, institutional um, 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 blockades, particularly the, um, the minimum requirement for power output to receive um, 1603 tax credit. Um, it, it, there are other grants for small-scale agricultural digesters, but um, I was wondering in, in Uganda if there are um, any obstructions to tying into the grid. I recently hosted a Fulbright scholar from India who was surprised in the United States that you actually had to pay to connect to the grid uh, to feed your excess power back in, into the system, where in India they, they pay you, they roll out the red carpet because you have a, a, a way to provide power. Um, and you had also mentioned the, the designer for home-scale biogas in Oregon. I, I did want to mention, since he's developed these plans and he's implementing these units in the Pacific Northwest, he's also met a, um, some resistance from code officials that really don't know quite what to do with this. There's, there's no law in the books for this. They, they don't know how to, how to manage it. And nothing will kill a budding industry quicker than an explosion in your backyard. So th they're doing everything they can to install pressure relief systems and flame arresters and, and actually help write the code with the city of Eugene at, at their um, small scale. So th they're working together with, with officials on that. So I think that's a proactive approach. But, but if you could tell me what kind of resistance there would be to, to inter intergrid applications in Uganda. Thanks, Doug. Um, well, you'll be very happy to know that the Ugandan government is extremely supportive of biogas development. Um, they have listed it as one of their priority uh, renewable energies within the renewable energy portfolio. And they're offering, in fact, to uh, biogas producers or people who are generating electricity from biogas a 20-year guaranteed rate of 11 and a half US cents per kilowatt hour that you produce. Guaranteed buy-in as long as you do a minimum of 500 um, kilowatts of energy production. So, and we went and we when we were in Uganda, we talked with um, the Ministry of Energy, we talked with the, with the regulatory agencies for electricity, we talked with the Rural Electrification Agency, the, there's like two other different agencies that we spoke to, we got all the information necessary and basically they, they, you know, they welcome you with open arms and basically they ask you to try to site your, you know, wherever your facility is going to be within two to five kilometers of uh, a main transmission line, and the country is actually pretty well connected. And basically, you have to attach an 11 kV or 33 kV line, and they'll connect you to the to the grid. If you're if you're in a also a very rural part of the country where there's a you know there's lack of transmission lines or distribution lines, period, then they will take on the cost of attaching of you know putting your electricity on the grid for you. And even if you're doing it, even if you're doing it in an area of the country like Kampala, where there is a, fair, a fairly good and well-developed electricity network, they still are willing to bear some of the costs, or it's going to be very minimal. So it's really, if you can produce the power, they will buy it, and they'll help you connect it to the grid. So it's, it's very encouraging. And that's, um, you know, some of their policies are actually uh, a model for other countries in Africa. I can shout again, but what what I what I feel you're really talking about a fantastic future because water is going to get increasingly important as population goes up. We're producing poop everywhere, and we flush it down into our water. And now we have a method where uh, over the years we have to get so we stop doing that. We preserve our water so it can be used for health th things, not for poop and uh, use our poop for fertilizer and gas. So anyway, it seems to me as though what you're offering us is over the next 50 to 60 years, we've got to get this integrated because the population's going up, water pollution's going up, water shortage is going up, we're 
not only using old reserve water that's down in the ground to irrigate, that, so we're wasting that, we're wasting surface water, and somehow it seems to me as though you guys are proposing the beginning of what I think should be the future, which is integrating all of this. We have uh, time for a couple more. Um, I know this gentleman had his hand up, and Gary, I saw your hand up after that. Three more, if we can, if our panelists can handle it. Thanks, uh, Mike Allen, Energy Law, Wisconsin. Um, I, w I was struck as I was watching the presentation about sort of an interesting contrast about between the Ugandan uh, use of the biogas for electricity as maybe a favored use for that byproduct, in addition to the cooking and from the small scale, but maybe from a larger one where you had excess biogas. Whereas locally, what I've seen from people participating in biogas, natural gas, uh, compressed natural gas developments is that there increasingly seem to be a view that the highest and best use of biogas, surplus biogas from large dairy farms is for transport rather than electricity. And I was just wondering if any of you had anything to say about the differences between Uganda and Wisconsin with respect to, first of all, if that's correct, and secondly, the differences between Wisconsin and Uganda may, that may be leading to different directions there. Yeah, that's definitely um, a good assessment. I think compressed natural gas does have a future in Uganda if the technology can be a little more plug and play and, a, and a, it require a bit more, a bit less maintenance. It would be a great solution in Uganda. The only hesitation we have is, you know, Uganda just found huge oil reserves under um, a lake in the in the north, and so I think there might be maybe not as much support now um, politically for developing an alternative fuel source when I think Uganda is very interested in promoting its own petroleum reserves that they just found in the last few years, or they've just been developing the last few years. Right now, I would say the favored use is electricity, yeah. And I think, you know, same kind of barriers to implementation as you see in Wisconsin. You know, more and more people are realizing it's a great uh, value proposition for them. But the net, the grid is kind of small still, right? There's only, what did we learn, 38 fueling stations in Wisconsin, which is a lot, but um, not enough for everyone to go out and convert their vehicle to CNG. But, I, but again, I think as more and more people adopt that technology and it becomes... Um, better tested and more robust, I think it'll be a great solution in Uganda as well. Uganda has huge problems with congestion and, and outdoor air pollution because of dirty diesel. And so I think in the future, it could be a, a great opportunity. But I think your assessment is correct right now that the favored end use for a large scale system in Uganda would be electricity right now. I'm Giri Venkatraman from the uh, Department of Electrical Engineering here, and um, I'm sort of listening to several of these conversations, and uh, as I walked in, there was a student here. She worked with me a couple of, semest couple of summers, a couple of years ago. We tried to build a very small biodigester that can go in your dorm room, and, um, <laughs> and um, so, and you know the the type of hum small scale and human scale technologies that we're talking about, there are lots of controversies, and there we're not well experienced with them. We heard about what happened in Oregon regarding trying to get laws and regulations written up, codes written up so that they can be acceptable. 
And it's not only true for biogas. If we talk about water or building or electricity generation, we have lots of regulatory frameworks and the technology as we're used to is different from the, the, the future we're looking at. And uh, you know, I've talked about this with John and other people at the Global Health Institute and the sustainability as well. Here on campus, what we need is a place where we can experiment with these things that are high risk without the regulatory barriers and experiment it and put, do science with it and understand it and the analytics of it and get the cost down from $10,000 to $100. And it's doable, I think. And not only in the sewage uh, uh, managing waste, but it's related to water treatment, electricity generation, um, just huge other impacts and in how indoor air quality, how buildings are built. There's got to be a reinvention of how we do things. And we need a field station here, either in the Arboretum or the Eagle Heights area, that where students and faculty and all of us can work together and then building this, rather than we don't have to go to 5,000 miles or 500 miles or 50 miles, to experiment this and demonstrate to ourselves and to educate our um, our regulators uh, to see how this works so that we can develop a, a level of confidence, we can expand beyond our campus into the so-called real world. Uh, so I don't know, I just need to get on the pillbox here and talk about it. So it's sort of, you know, I got, uh, let me pitch, uh, there's this email list going on. Uh, this morning I got an email from Robin from Global Health Institute on doing a field study course next year. And I'm hoping, I'm proposing right now after this conversation, let's do a field study course here on campus to build a biogas digester. If you're an undergraduate student, graduate student, interested in working with me on that, put your name on that list and I'll send you an email and we'll do that here and hopefully John's here and put him on, putting him on the spot. We'll be develop funding for this uh, field studies course. Thank you. Thanks, and you know what? Um, UW Oshkosh is doing it, so. I know. We can't, we know, uh, so that's a challenge. The, get, uh, get behind <laughs> it. So, let, yeah, let's try to build some momentum to get it done on this campus. We, we fully agree with you. Thanks. Okay. Is it working? I'm Amanda Mon. I'm with the State Energy Office. And I was just wondering, um, from Aaliyah and Sarah, from your work here, and Vianney and Alex from the last few days, what were the things that you've learned um, about what Wisconsin is doing that you think will be most useful for you in Uganda? Thanks for the tough question, Amanda. <laughs> We're still trying to digest all the information from the last couple of days. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, I'm not a comedian, obviously. Yeah. Um, I think at least one thing that we've been talking about is the amazing range um, and scales of you know technologies that we've seen here in Wisconsin and how customizable it is. You know everything from dry digestion to mixed plug systems to you know sort of hybrid systems that people have been developing. The, the types of generators they've been using, the sizes, the, you know, whether or not they're using manure at all, you know, just the range of feedstocks. So I think we've gotten really excited about how we could try to play around or experiment and design something that could really work well in Kampala and then to, you know, see if we can replicate that in different places by customizing it to the, you know, to the specific place that we're planning on working in. Um, and I know, I know Vianney is probably going to be doing some adapting of his own small scale digesters when he goes back to, to, uh, to Uganda. So I think, you know, we're just been excited by what we've seen um, as the range of possibilities that are, that are, you know, that have been open to us um, based on our, exp our experiences the last week or so. And thanks for helping make that happen. Yeah. I can add something, although I didn't attend the meetings, but you know, we eat a lot of brats here and they're not very healthy and maybe we could use those as a starter in these <laughs> biodigesters. <laughs> so, um, no, I just, I wanna thank the panel um, and especially thank all of you for coming to this 
Uh, it's you know not not the average person that would come to a seminar called the power of poop. So I want to thank all of you, especially for show, uh, showing up, and many of you are already plugged into this this exciting project. And thanks for that support. Um, of course, I want to th um, also remind you that this was not only uh, co-sponsored by the Global Health Institute, but the Office of Sustainability. So thanks to the Office of Sustainability. And you will have an opportunity to hear not only Aliyah again, but Professor uh, Giri uh, Venkataramanan uh, on November 8th. If you mark your calendars, November 8th, you'll get the the update on uh, energy and health on Wisconsin, right? You're, you've, I've signed you up. Um, but uh, we do have time left over to uh, now get out of your seats and meet each other. Uh, we still have the room for at least another 15 minutes. But uh, again, help me uh, thank the panelists and thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>